Hello and welcome to Out of the Blue with Graham Little and Joanne Sally. Tonight we're live from Belfast. They're about to hit the road with Gary Barlow on his nationwide tour, so they must have the X Factor at Alabama Sisters, the Pierces. His work has been exhibited all over the world, from the States to China. But tonight, sculptor Brendan Jameson makes a 60 minute masterpiece out of. Well, sugar, of course. And he's not even a cubist. We'll see what he does in his own sweet way later and tell you how you can own it. And waitress to actress isn't a myth. Our sofa guest went from Pizza Express tables to the West End stage via the old mountaintop. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Yes, it's Connie Fisher. <laughs> Now, Connie, we know you uh, from your Welsh upbringing, but a lot of people watching this programme might not be aware that you're actually a local girl born just a couple of miles down the road. I am. I was born in Lisbon and uh, I came back a couple of years ago with the Sound of Music to the Grand Opera House and that was the first time I've been back in 20, 26 years. So wow. We left up quite young. My dad was in the army and during the Troubles, 1983, it was kind of, you know, kind of tough, so we moved away quite quickly. But um, we still have that Celtic connection, I think, living in Wales and coming back to Island. Absolutely, it's very similar, isn't it? It is quite, We're yeah. All in one and very musical pack. as well, very <laughs> musical. So it's, it's quite an exciting place. Um, and, and for my family, actually, I brought my mum back on Mother's Day and um, we had an amazing time um, here in Ireland. And I think um, it's nice, actually. I'd like to bring my family back here one day and have a big reunion. Oh, lovely. Have a little cottage in the countryside. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, unless you've been on Planet Zog, you'll know that one of the largest music events on this planet rocked Belfast last night. Yes, it was. Of course, the MTV European Music Awards, which saw a whole host of celebrities descend on the town. Now, did you get up close and personal with an A-lister? So if so, we want your pictures. Email them to us at outoftheblue at bbc.co.uk and we'll aim to show the best later on. The more famous, of course, the better. The awards last night could just be the start of a Northern Irish musical renaissance. Our own musical export, Neve Perry, was there. Tonight, as many as 1.2 billion eyes could be on Belfast as the MTV European Music Awards rock this city. For one night only, it's a billing that pop and rock fans in Northern Ireland could usually only dream of. Lady Gaga, Coldplay, Red Hot Chili Peppers and for all you believers out there, Justin's here too. Performing across three stages, it's the biggest music event in our history. MTV said it was the vibrant nightlife and compelling music scene of the city that attracted its attention. And who could forget the infamous Rihanna music video that she chose to film here. So is our wee city that would fit near enough 30 times into London on the verge of becoming a big time musical mecca? Stranger things have happened. It started with Liverpool in the 60s. Then it was the turn of Sheffield in the 80s and Manchester in the 90s. Beatlemania, Electropop and Mad Manchester all saw music change those places for good. I worked for New Musical Express when the whole Manchester era was kicking off in the late 80s. And you'd go to Affleck's Palace and people would buy the T-shirts. You would go to the Hacienda to see bands dancing. Manchester, like Belfast, has a village mentality. It's quite small. It's got its Victorian architecture. It, it makes a, a cool issue out of that old uh, industry. We've had our shipyards and we've had our, our uh, rope works and all the rest of it. And I think that there's a kind of a gur in the sound of Belfast which comes from that. This is why our punk rock kind of era was so exciting. And I think that translates into the music of David Holmes, translates into the music of Therapy and Ash. And obviously, yeah, bands like Snow Patrol now can kind of put their hands in their heart and sing I Love the City Tonight. You know, they call it a love song to Belfast. So do you think it's been a conscious effort to change the music scene in Belfast or do you think it's just happened by chance? I would say it probably began around 1994 when, when Van Morrison played in front of the City Hall to President Clinton and Hillary Clinton. And that was a big feel-good moment. 
That was the first time I think it became almost an issue of policy to use music to make Belfast look like a great place. Cultural tourism is something like 22% of the tourist market now. So people want to come to a city to see what its unique musical story is. And Belfast's got an amazing musical story. The council have thrown their weight behind the Belfast music scene with the newly established annual Belfast Music Week. Last week, over 170 gigs happened with bright young things like Wonder Villains, Eaten by Bears and Axes Of, all hoping to capture the eyes and ears of record labels a and r -Men. Cashier number 9 are one band tipped to be the next big thing from these shores. They've just been confirmed as the only act from here so far to perform on the official lineup at South by Southwest, the world's biggest music industry get-together held this March in Texas. So when was your first gig then as cashier number 9? I, I think it was the Menagerie maybe, you know, in, in the University Street. It was like a club night David Holmes used to put on, so we played in there for him, which was great. And it's really nice, dirty old sweaty power, you know. Um, we played at uh, the Northern Irish Music Awards in yeah. Belfast last Wednesday and it was really apparent the calibre and you know the standard of not just bands within Belfast and Northern Ireland but bands from here that are doing really well all around the world. Bands like Two Door Cinema Club who are doing so well. So I watch you from afar who are doing great things and then there's the bigger guys like Snow Patrol. I think Belfast is as good as anywhere in the UK, you know, there's loads of great venues loads of rehearsal rooms, so there's tons of resources in the city that weren't here 15 or 20 years ago. Evidence does seem to be pointing to a music-led mini cultural revolution. New bars, new venues and new bands. The owners of an Ibiza super club have even chosen Belfast as home to their first venue outside the party island. There's never been a better time to be made in Belfast. Connie, are your musical tastes strictly from the musicals? Well, not really. I mean, my if you see my record collection, it's pretty eclectic. I like anything to, from Lady Gaga to Elaine Page, really, anything. Um, and I think, you know, I kind of agree with you, anything made in Belfast is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> well, that'll get you full marks whenever you come on this show. <laughs> you are qualified, we should point out, Connie, you have a degree in, in musical theatre, but you didn't jump straight from that into playing Maria. You had to go via Pizza Express and yes. tele -sales. sales and things. <laughs> was there ever a stage when you thought, you know, I'm just not going to make it? Yeah, there was a whole lot of doubt. Um, and I think that was good because you've suffered a lot of rejection. I went for loads of auditions and came second a lot of the time. So when the opportunity to play a Julie role came up, a Julie Andrews role, which is everything I wanted, um, I heard that years before they were workshopping The Sound of Music and I couldn't leave drama school to go and have an audition because they wouldn't allow you to do that. So after I left, I was stuck in telesales thinking I'm going to give up soon. When the opportunity came along, I just had to, had to go for it. And I had nothing to lose. You know, I was getting constant rejection on the phones. I was sick of, you know, asking, would you like olives or nuts? <laughs> so, <laughs> to be honest, I, I had nothing to lose. And I, I still can't believe to this day that I won. I have to pinch myself every day. Yeah, and of course, we're going to have a wee look at it now. The, oh, the, no. mo the moment that made the big break. <laughs> for one of you, life is about to change forever. The girl, the public have cast to be Maria Von Trapp is. Connie! Oh my goodness, it's one of those ah moments, isn't Have it? Have you ever seen a face like it? <laughs> it's oh, fantastic. Oh. Now that was 2006, does that still make your heart jump out of your chest? It does, I'm still nervous that I might not win. It's, <laughs> it's the kind of thing that Elaine Page does all the time, they're going you know, to find me out, or I think it's Judy Dench, it? You know, they're going to find me out when I go on stage, and you're constantly worried that it's, it's all a dream. You know? it, was, it must have been absolutely terrifying for you, wasn't it? It was terrifying, and the fact that Andrew Lloyd Webber was one of the judges as well. I never thought that I'd actually get to meet him you know I thought I'd only see his name on, on a piece of music so to actually to perform for him and actually sing some of his own songs was really nerve-wracking and working with him and working with a, a big a big sort of family in a, in a major big show like that everybody thinks it's you know one big happy family but there have been films like The Black Swan which maybe portray a different side to it was your experience all, all positive um, yes well yes well no <laughs> <laughs> I mean 
every day is like Groundhog Day, so you compare it to the last. And of course, there are moments where you don't get on with everyone. And I remember at the Palladium, there was one particular lady who didn't like me very much, or perhaps didn't like the way I was doing something. Mm. I, I'm not sure, but I remember singing, thinking she hates me, she hates me, <laughs> and we're smiling at each other. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm playing Marie, and I'm all very nice and bubbly, and she hates me. Mm -hmm. And there's that look in her eye. I think, oh gosh. And I used to think that we're getting on quite well, but those were just our characters getting mm. on quite well. Yeah. And um, but there are moments then of. of just joy and a family on tour. It's nothing like being the UK tour I did for 18 months as well. Did Palladium for 18 months and on tour for 18 months. I've got to say the UK tour was like one big family and I've got friends for life that I've made from oh, on that tour. That's Great. lovely. Now there's been some healthy debate in the last week about whether murals in Belfast depicting the Troubles should be painted over with fresh images of life in the city. But you seldom have to look far in any part of the country to find public works of art that divide opinion. We've been down Down Patrick Way to see if the locals think the large metal sculpture on the edge of the town is a saint or a sinner. I did my best to notice when the call came down. The Hi, my name is Coleman McGuinness. I'm a local businessman down Patrick. And uh, our new monument, I think, says a lot about Down Patrick. I think this in Patrick's sculpture it marks the entrance of the town it marks the returning of st patrick to ireland to spread his christian message it was designed by a lady called melanie jackson from cheshire i think sometimes if you get somebody from the outside looking in on us they give us a different interpretation of what we have it sits high on the stone base and the landscaping it looks as though it's st patrick looking out over his flock it marks the regeneration of Down Patrick and the way forward. Are we human or are we dancers? Hello, my name is Martin Carter. I'm a local artisan based on a local arts collective in Belfast. And uh, the more I think about this piece of sculpture, the more it becomes some sort of decoration. It becomes uh, artistically very, very little, but it becomes something like you would see on a, you know, a Christmas tree. I don't really see it as being something that has the merits to be on the outside of a town. It's not very pleasing to the eye. It doesn't really represent Down Patrick in my eyes. It represents something Christian with the, uh, the crozier being held in the hand. But even in the description of Scott Wilson, they say it has a Celtic-like squirrel somewhere in the sculpture. We could do better. Well, who do you agree with? Vote with your feet. I feel the statue is a fine addition to the town. For the strangers coming in on the main road to Down Patrick, it raises a question mark, causes them to look a bit further, and we have the St Patrick's Centre to, to back up all the questions that they have. I think it's um, a three-dimensional doodle, and it's ill thought out, and doesn't reflect anything of the area. Personally, I think it just takes away from the actual St Patrick's Monument, out on St Patrick's Mountain and so on. And tourists come, they've no idea where it is, and there's no proper tourist information, and it it takes away from the town personally. To bring this new statue of new materials to be erected is a great idea and a good aspect to the town. I just don't think it's a particularly good piece of art to be quite honest with you. Are we human or are we dancers? Oh, everybody's a critic, Connie. It must be difficult being a being a performer and having to put up with people that like you or don't like you. Yes. Especially in a demanding role. I mean, you pl you played Maria what nearly a hundred times, and oh, not it, more it than took that. its toll on, about, on your health. For, first of all, yeah, I've probably played about a thousand, couple of thousand times. Really? You know, quite a long right. time. Um, three years stage time playing her, so it was you know quite demanding, um, and it is difficult. You know, you can't please everyone all of the time. But you have to remember that every night you've got a new audience, mm. so try not to get too complacent about going on stage. And, and physically it took it out of you. You yeah. were told at one stage you, you could never sing again. Yeah, I think that was for, for different reasons. I mean, um, I, well, it's obviously vocal, vocally I, I found it difficult and demanding anyway, but um, after I left the Palladium, I 
developed a croak in my voice and I was finding it difficult doing another show that I was doing with Alistair McGowan. Mm. I was performing at the Menier Chocolate Factory with him and in a completely different show. It was quite a funny show and really high energy and I find it quite difficult. So um, I went to uh, get looked at and you couldn't see anything from above and it turns out I was diagnosed with something I was born with, oh um, which meant I should never have been a singer. Oh, wow. But I think I learned to sing around it. Now was that the same as Julie Andrews? She had problems? No, um, I think Julie Andrews um, had nodules um, through just overexertion and, right. and vocally perhaps pushing herself because you know she was in demand she was, she was hot stuff really in, in musical theater and mm -hmm. I think she did Victor Victoria and created nodules and went to have them lopped off and perhaps um, had difficulties afterwards but yeah. um, we actually both now have the same vocal surgeon that's right so that's <laughs> my claim to fame so we I suppose we have the same fate but um, for different reasons well as they say you know one door closes and another opens and you're pursuing actually a new career in Wales yeah that's a line from the sound of music actually when God shuts a door he opens a window <laughs> and I am actually um, I'm doing a cartoon at the moment voicing over for S4C which is our Welsh channel yes. I'm doing Poppy Cat which is quite Fun. and um, we've got doing 52 episodes of that but my new kind of venture really is, is presenting and I've had um, a program called Connie's musical map of Wales so watch out Ireland maybe there'll be a musical map of Ireland one day <laughs> but it would be a detailed does. map does, does that mean you're, you're going to turn your back on stage altogether you're going no. to start start presenting I don't think time? I could having you know gained a you know not that it means much with a piece of paper but a first class honours in musical theatre you think of trained to be mm. on the stage um, in any capacity really I, I like presenting I like meeting new people but I don't think I could ever fully leave the stage there's a, my heart's always always really you know on stage well I'm glad to hear Connie because you have some massive fans here in Belfast <laughs> earlier we asked you to send in photos of celebrities that you'd met over the weekend now, I don't think this was taken at the weekend but this is sent in by Christopher <gasps> Patterson who met his idol somebody called Connie Fisher? <laughs> no, that's such an old <laughs> photograph. It's Chris Patterson. I shall never forgive Chris him. Chris Patterson, yeah. Never forgive Chris. Do you remember no, that? it's very. I do actually. Yeah, that wasn't far from here, was it? It's opposite my favourite cafe. It's a little cafe <laughs> over And uh, I remember, I remember meeting him. But he caught me on, on the hop there. So, more makeup needed next time. Yeah. Big star, yeah. Connie Fisher. <laughs> Fantastic. And we've got Roy Porter here with Brian May, looking very cool with his big hair. I've got one actually. I've got one. Who have you got? Um, I've got Justin Bieber. Hold it up so we can see. Um, with. Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber think? with Eliz Elizabeth McDade in Hillsborough. She saw Justin Bieber at the LMFAO at the M Club. Sounds like a code of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it really Justin Bieber? I'm not yeah. sure. And this apparently mm. is Bruno Mars. Niall Smith has sent this. Saw Bruno Mars in Belfast through the window. I might add. He looks exactly the same as in his videos. Doesn't he? Just. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sending those in, and thanks to Connie. And Connie's in a long line of stars born here before hitting the big time elsewhere. Colin Bateman now has the story of a slip of a lass from Belfast who ended up 5,000 miles away under the bright lights of Hollywood. But unlike Connie, this girl's voice wasn't her fortune. In Hollywood, Long before the brand names of Branagh and Neeson, an earlier band of Irish legends lit up the silver screen. One of the brightest of the silent movie era was the Blanchette or Knightley of her day, but unlike Kate or Kira, many would struggle to remember her name. Welcome to the South Belfast world of Eileen Percy. By 1927, our Eileen was making five films a year, from westerns to romances. But the story of her and other Irish movie stars begins not in LA, but 3,000 miles east in New York. This is where America's movie industry really began. You had a lot of famous Irish entertainers uh, on the American stage, vaudeville, uh, slides and they would have gone on to films. And sometimes they played Irish characters. Sometimes, interestingly enough, they didn't. They played every ethnicity but Irish. Mm -hmm. And this is how Molly made good, which is typical of the sort of movie they were making at the time? Very much so. This is kind of a feature film version of what a, a storyline really that had existed for, for decades. And so you have, uh, well, kind of what the title suggests. You have an Irish immigrant uh, who comes to America, and Molly, and she makes good. She achieves the American dream, as it was seen at the time. A young Eileen Percy in Belfast may well have seen early American flicks as export markets opened up overseas. By the beginning of the 20th century, picture houses were springing up all over the city. 
but life on the streets outside was anything but a Hollywood fantasy. They lived here in Vernon Street for about nine years and uh, Eileen and her two elder brothers James and John went to a local primary school here, Protestant primary school. Mm -hmm. Her father was a Presbyterian uh, and her mother was a baptised Roman Catholic. Eileen's father uh, was a, a law clerk in Belfast. In 1907, I believe he went uh, to New York, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and uh, to work towards the, to pave the way for the family to join him, basically to escape what would probably be a, a really poverty-stricken lifestyle. Soon, in 1909, Eileen and her 12-year-old brother set sail from Londonderry to New York. Eileen got her first break as a 15-year-old chorus girl in the Broadway hit Siegfried Follies. Next, she landed a film and was signed up by the movie mogul and heartthrob Douglas Fairbanks. And this was really the greatest thing that could have happened to her because Fairbanks by uh, that time was one of the not only one of the biggest stars, but he went on to found United Artists. He, his, his feature films were among the greatest box office successes. He was really the best break Eileen could have gotten. Eileen was cast as leading lady alongside Fairbanks in hit westerns such as The Man from Painted Post in 1917. Soon the movie industry had decamped to Hollywood. Why? Because Californian sunshine gave longer filming days. Before she knew it, Eileen was starring with the great Rudolph Valentino. She partied hard with tycoons Jack Warner and Howard Hughes. She signed with Fox and made an amazing 64 films in a decade. But almost overnight, the movies became the talkies. Eileen may have looked the part, but like so many other silent movie stars, she just didn't sound it. Eileen Percy was now relegated to bit parts. In the next five years, she made just five films. Others fared even worse. Many people lost their careers. Uh, you take an example like Carl Dane, who was an actor who had a very thick accent. His career ended abruptly. He was uh, despondent. He opened a hot dog stand outside the studio where he had worked, and it didn't even make a success. And he goes on to commit suicide. So this was what was happening to a lot of people's careers, and it had an effect on Eileen's. Eileen Percy was last on screen in the 30s, but she more than kept her head above water as a newspaper columnist till she died in 1973. Not exactly a Hollywood ending, but there's no getting away from it. The girl from Vernon Street had come a long way. That's an extraordinary story. Um, for the last 60 minutes, sculptor Brendan Jameson has been hard at work on his knees doing his Sugar Cubist masterpiece. Let's see what he's doing. Now, you've finished, haven't you? Yes, I've just completed. This is a, a sculpture relief of Belfast City Hall of the front facade. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's incredible. I'm sort of afraid to touch it. Now, um, you've, you've done about a thousand sugar, cu sugar cubes here, as you said. But you've done the Tate Modern, and that was about 80 stone and 100,000 su sugar cubes. So you're used to working on a much grander scale. Yes, absolutely, and especially it suits something like the Tate Modern, which is such an iconic building and, and so colossal. So to make something like that on a grand scale is such a strong statement. Now, for me, I was thinking, you know, big piece of work. Why are you using tiny sugar cubes? Tiny sugar cubes, they're, they're so beautiful to cut and carve, and I love the glistening surface on, on the, um, the finished sculpture. And very impressively, you've actually been summoned now by Downing Street. Uh, yes, I've been uh, invited to, to create a sugar cube sculpture of number 10 Downing Street for an exhibition inside Downing Street in February 2012. Now, so that's February. How long will that take? That will probably take about two months to complete. Wow, that's incredible. What, what inspires you? Obviously, it's architecture for this piece. Is it always architecture? No, I'm also very inspired by the organic and natural worlds as well as the architectural. And for that, you use wool and wax and other materials? Yes, I'm always drawn to very unusual materials. I uh, always like to try and push the boundaries of contemporary sculpture. And you sure have, and it's so impressive. Now, you just have to, sh to sign your coffee table. Sure. No, and we're saying that obviously as well, this is going to be nicely covered up, isn't it? So 
It's beautiful. Um, if you would like Brendan's work as a centrepiece in your living room, here's how you can get your hands on it. All the works made by artists and out of the blue will be auctioned off with the proceeds going to BBC Children in Need. Log on to bbc.co.uk slash pudsey and go to the Northern Ireland section for more information. Graham. Thanks to Anne. Well done, Brendan. Time for some music now, and we're honoured to have sisters Alison and Catherine with us tonight, otherwise known, of course, as the Pierces. Welcome, girls. Thank Hi. you. Thanks. Welcome to Belfast. You Thank should have been here yesterday, of course. I know. Massive musical occasion. We missed Bieber Fever. You missed Bieber Fever. I know you're gutted by that, Catherine. <laughs> it's been an amazing year for you girls as well, we have to say, since moving to the UK. Albums gone gold, all over the place, constantly played on radio too. You must be delighted with how things are going. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how could we not? be really it's it was just such a nice surprise to come over here and you know we've been doing this for a really long time so to have it finally begin to work was really really a good feeling taking you back you grew up in Alabama <coughs> and didn't go to school <laughs> taught we at home. homeschooled yeah was there much academic work taught at all or was it all music it was, and dancing it was, it was a little probably 20 percent academics <laughs> and 80 percent <laughs> creative arts <laughs> <laughs> including ballet you both yeah. accomplished ballerinas I hear yeah mm -hmm. Our mom's a painter, our dad's a, a plays guitar, our sister's a dancer, our brother's a photographer, so we were kind of immersed in a creative world. Yeah. Now the next big thing we're going to see you here in the UK is supporting Gary Barlow. How did, how did that come about? We met him at a festival we did together, um, and uh, he, he heard our stuff and really liked it, so just asked us to come open for him. You're pretty different musical tastes, I would think. How do you think his fans will, will react to your sound? I don't know. We'll see. I think yeah. they'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's an amazing songwriter, and so we were honoured that he asked us to do it. Yeah, well, I hope I'm sure that we'll like to hear you tonight, so I'll let you go and get ready. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And we're back out of the blue next week. See how a Victorian form of art is making a comeback. Yes, and you might know him best as Evil Archie from EastEnders or Lovable Dad and Gavin and Stacey. Larry Lamb will be with us. Join us Monday, 7.30 on BBC One. Right now, though, with kissing you goodbye, we'll say goodbye with the Pierces. Goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs> strikes three in the morning and I lie sleepless cause he don't know I broke my promise and he don't know I've done So I think I will leave you guessing after all you put me through. In the early light, I found you with a bottle by your side. I can see by your eyes you know what I am. I'm kissing you goodbye.